morning and welcome. Please stand as you are able for the ringing of the bell and for the singing of our processional hymn. We'll sing verses 1 and 5. liturgy continues on page three of your bulletin. Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. Let us all kneel. God spake these words and said, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor worship them. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor thy father and thy mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt do no murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Thou shalt not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us. Write all these laws in our hearts. We beseech thee. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. 
Amen. We will say together the Trisagion, printed on page five, three times. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted of Satan, make speed to help thy servants who are assaulted by manifold temptations. And as thou knowest their several infirmities, let each one find thee mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruits of the ground which you harvest, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord, your God, you shall make the response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, so now I bring the first of the fruits of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able and join me in reading Psalm 91 on page 6 in your bulletin. He who dwelleth in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I put my trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, there shall no evil happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall hear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot upon stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, you shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. 
He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Please be seated. A reading from the letter to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him shall be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. After his baptism, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for him from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You may be seated. <clears throat> the temptation of Christ, our gospel story today, occurs right after Jesus has been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And now, before beginning his public ministry, he, Jesus goes out into the wilderness to fast, to reflect, 
and to prepare. Now, wilderness is a recurring motif in the Christian story and in the story of Israel. The Hebrew people wandered in the desert as God revealed to them the sort of community he wanted them to be. Jacob wrestled with the angel in the wilderness to receive a blessing. And we too may feel like we've been wandering in a wilderness the last couple of years. The wilderness motif, well, it's a symbol. It's a symbol for times in life when we are taken out of what is normal and comfortable. It can be dry and hot and sandy or perhaps filled with wild animals and cactus and unruly plants with thorns. But something happens in that wilderness. We are shaped to become more fully God's people in this liminal place of hunger and wrestling. And now Jesus too is in the wilderness. And all during his 40 days, Satan has been tempting him. And today we catch up with him at the end of that time and get to be a sand fly on the dunes as Satan tries one last time to tempt Jesus. First, Jesus is tempted to trust in his own ability rather than trusting in God's provision. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Second, he's tempted to trade his commitment to God for a relationship that promises shortcuts to power and glory. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Third, he is tempted to question whether God really is with him and therefore try forcing God's hand to prove it. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here and see if what the scriptures write is true, that you will be lifted up. The theme all of these temptations have in common is a theme of distorting his relationship to God. And to each of the temptations, Jesus replies with scripture from Deuteronomy, when Israel wandered in the wilderness. But Jesus resists where Israel gave in. Jesus acknowledges the true source of his identity and vision for life. Now, the significance of Jesus being tempted in this way before beginning his ministry is it would have derailed everything had he given in. It would have distorted his relationship with the Father. It would have dulled his vision, and his ministry would have ended before it even began. And Jesus' temptation prompts us to consider how we respond to the temptation we find our we find in thinking that our source is something other than God. The temptation to gaze inward at our own navels rather than seeing in an outward looking way that connects us in relationship to God and the world around us. And we can't talk about temptation without thinking about that other word, sin. But what exactly is sin? There have actually been a lot of takes on the concept because the early church didn't define the concept of sin with exact precision. Everybody agreed that human beings were sinful, but there was a difference of opinion about how it all works. Some of us may have been taught sin is a black smudge on our souls. It's part of our nature, and if we pray a certain prayer, Jesus will wipe that sin away and we'll be white as snow. Or is sin what we do when we break a set of rules? The Pharisees of Jesus' time thought so. Follow the rules and you're in the club. Break them and you are a sinner not bound for the pearly gates. That view can still be found today. I I think of billboards I see when I'm driving down the highway or sermons depicted in a movie given by a preacher in a loud voice going on about fire and brimstone. Now, if you do any research about the theological theories of the nature of sin, you better set aside some time because theologians have been trying to hash this one out 
since the time of Pelagius and Augustine. Put a pin in that for some further formation classes. Is humanity inherently evil or inherently good? What role does free will play in the whole thing? And you will go down the rabbit hole looking into the amount of words written on concupiscence, free will, disobedience, Neoplatonism, and the idea of original sin. The reality you start to see is it's complicated, and it feels daunting to disentangle it all. So let me simplify it for you. When we choose to close our hearts, when we operate from a place of disconnection from ourselves, from the creation around us, from our families and communities and neighborhoods, from our spouses or siblings, and foremost, from the presence of God's life-giving and loving source of being, we make choices that hurt one another and hurt ourselves. Now, a Neoplatonist view would explain it like this. The further we get from the source of life, the Godhead, through our own choices of free will, the more we break down from God's original desire for our lives. So in this way of thinking, sin is either A, the things we do when we are not connected with our source, or B, the very state of not being connected to our source. And so we must ever be rooted in our relationship with God, a relationship that will ask us to self-reflect, to soften our hearts, to be humble, to remember we really know nothing, to show mercy and compassion, to be slow to anger and judgment, to remember, yes, we are but dust, but while we are here, we must be dust that shines with the beauty of the heartbeat of God. Because our relationship with God sets the tone for every other relationship. Our relationship within ourselves. Do we live with integrity and act responsibly? Do we use laziness as an excuse to not act where we should? Do we reflect on the Beatitudes and the example of Jesus and acknowledge how we do or do not express that in our own thoughts and actions? And the tone of our relationship with the creation around us. How do we steward what we have been blessed with? Do we look at the world with open eyes and ears to see and hear where care is needed? Do we choose to have long-term vision that thinks about the systems we create and their impact? And it also sets the tone for our relationships with one another. Do we seek to listen and understand even when we disagree? Do we forgive? Do we exercise patience? Do we feed and clothe and shelter one another? When we don't remain rooted in our source of life, we sever the connection that enables us to see rightly. And we destroy the relationship from which all others draw their life. It's right there in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you sin. We sin when we choose to go our own way and break our relationship with God. Sin comes from broken relationships and it is also the state of being in broken relationship. This might be a way of understanding original sin. And we sin when we stubbornly choose not to see. Because it actually matters what we see. Now, I was at Lowe's the other day, and I saw all the gardening supplies and plants were in stock. And it then dawned on me, I'm back in Texas now, and March means spring is around the corner. 
It also means I have to turn my attention towards the backyard. And I just haven't had it in me to look at it, to see it. Because there's a lot that needs to be done. Things have piled up. Partially used bags of soil, a bag of charcoal, a broken frisbee, empty pots. The fence needs to be repaired and the windows need washing. Dogs have made messes and old plants need to be pulled up to prepare the beds for spring planting. <clears throat> See, it's been much easier to not look at it all winter because it feels overwhelming. It looks overwhelming. But then later that evening, I was in the backyard and I did start looking at it. I saw how with a hammer I could straighten out some bent places in the fence and it would make a huge difference. I could take the water hose to the windows and wash away the cobwebs. And you know, once we start, it becomes a little easier. And so the next morning, I, I got my roommates out there and I, I, I had them start looking at it. And when you start to look and you see the state of things, you must do one of two things. Close your eyes again or do something about it. Too often, we choose the former rather than the latter. And that is what sin is also. Choosing not to see Choosing not to look because you want to avoid the responsibility. But keeping our eyes closed, not seeing, that's how Putin happens. That's how Hitler happens. That's how hate and fear take root. Looking requires something of us. Looking means I have to go pull the weeds out of my garden and encourage my roommates to hose off the windows and clean up their trash as well. But looking is also the first step towards change and towards restoration. When we see sin as broken relationship with God, others, and creation, well, that is something we can take action on because we do have the gift of free will. We choose whether or not to be in relationship with God. That relationship, because of Christ, is always there. It is always there waiting for us. And that is the place we start. And so, in this wilderness of Lent, we turn back. We have a moment in time and space that's a pause. And in it, let us reflect on the ways we have given in to the temptation to abandon our relationship with God and thus damage our relationship with everything else and render us unable to see. Let us ask where this blindness has allowed things to pile up in the backyards of our hearts and of our minds. We have been given life. We have been given a world full of beauty and possibility and blessing. And when we do nothing with it, when we waste it, that is sin as well. I guess what I'm trying to say, y'all, is the Lord, your God, is one. And we are created as one with God. And God is in us, and therefore we are one with each other. When we forget this identity of oneness, this identity of relationship, and fall into isolationist thinking, we fall into sin. We fall into something that is not our intended nature. I want to close with something about pecans. We here in Texas know a little something about pecans. They're a mast fruiting tree meaning they produce at unpredictable intervals each year. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a biologist and member of the Potawatomi Nation, writes in Braiding Sweetgrass about pecan trees. And I'm going to close with this small excerpt. Mast fruiting trees spend years making sugar. 
And rather than spending it little by little, they stick it under the proverbial mattress, banking calories as starch in their roots. When the account has a surplus, only then could my grandpa bring home pounds of nuts. This boom and bust cycle remains a playground of hypotheses for tree physiologists and evolutionary biologists. Forest ecologists hypothesize that massed fruiting is the simple outcome of this energetic equation. Make fruit only when you can afford it. That makes sense. But trees grow and accumulate calories at different rates depending on their habitats. So, like the settlers who got the fertile farmland, the fortunate ones would get rich quickly and fruit often, while their shaded neighbors would struggle and only rarely have an abundance, waiting for years to reproduce. So, if this were true, each tree would fruit only on its own schedule, predictable by the size of its reserves of stored starch. But they don't. If one tree fruits, they all fruit. There are no soloists. Not one tree in a grove, but the whole grove. Not one grove in the forest, but every grove, all across the country and all across the state. The trees act not as individuals, but somehow as a collective. Exactly how they do this, we don't yet know. But what we see is the power of unity. What happens to one happens to us all. We can starve together or feast together. All flourishing is mutual. And while we may not know what has the pecan trees fruit together, we do know what binds us together. And that is our God, our Lord, our Savior. And so I speak to you in the name of one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we say together the Nicene Creed, printed on page 8. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church in the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name 
may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially our presiding bishop, Michael, our bishops, Andy, Kay, Jeff, and Hector, our assisting priest, Dave, our deacon, Becky, and our campus missioner, Rachel, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land especially our President Joe, our Governor Greg, our Mayor Tim, our District Attorney Henry, our County Judge David, our Police Chief Sean, and our City Manager Bryn, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all their works that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those affected by COVID and those on our parish prayer list. And here we may add additional petitions and thanksgivings. We do pray especially for the people and country of Ukraine. We pray also for our vestry. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Jay, David, James, and Jean, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Let us join in the prayer for our new rector. O oh God, as we are entering this time in the life of Christ Church, refresh us with a new vision and help us to meet all, all duties and responsibilities that come to us. May we show hospitality to our new rector, Keith, and welcome him with our support and prayers. Fill him, O oh Lord, with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and understanding. We beseech ye for the touch of your spirit that his heart may yield to you in obedience, reverence, and confidence. Grant your Sir Herbert Keith may find his strength and dedication from the leading of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the opportunities that are ours. Help us to meet them with courage and trust in you may be filled with the gratitude of the Savior Jesus, who lifts us from the burden of sin and anxiety, and gather this family about yourself and protect us. In the name of the one who calls us beyond ourselves, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn unto him. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Please stand if you're able. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Well, good morning and welcome to everyone this morning. I'm Sally Louth, the parish administrator here at Christ Episcopal Church, and we are so thankful that you're with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, there should be a communication card in the pew back in front of you. If you'd like to fill that out and put it in the offering plate, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Um, also, uh, there should be a place on there for you to put your email. Most of our announcements and things come through uh, email that gets sent out a couple of times a week. If you'd like to receive those, give us your email address and we'll be sure to add you. We have a couple of welcomes this morning, so thank you to uh, our uh, campus missioner, Rachel Harbour, for her wonderful sermon this morning. Thank you for coming and being with us today. We welcome you. And we also have a blessing, Ashley Carter, who is in our uh, choir, is actually going to be singing our offertory anthem today. So uh, two double blessings this morning. Um, a couple of things on the announcements. Um, the vestry, as Becky alluded to in her prayers, are on retreat this weekend. Father Keith is there with them, um, so they're building uh, the future for our church. So keep them in your prayers. They're finishing up this morning, uh, but keep that in your prayers, and um, they should come back ready and, and on fire and excited. A couple of things coming up this week. Tomorrow is our day for the hot meal for Feed My Sheep. Uh, if you want to help prepare the meal, you can head over to the Feed My Sheep uh, place on Avenue G uh, at 9.30. Otherwise, if you want to just come and help serve, that's at 11. So we'd love to have anybody who would like to volunteer to help with the hot meal at Feed My Sheep. On Wednesday, um, the Hand in Hand Fellowship meets at 1 p.m. They meet on the second Wednesday of the month each month. This is a group of folks that come together just to sort of support each other um, as they are uh, helping with others who are maybe struggling with health, sh health issues and things like that. So you're welcome to join that at any time. And then we start a brand new adult forum today at 9.30 in the library. Um, and this, um, during Lent, we're going to focus on preparing for your own loved one's death or and funeral, your own or a loved one's death or funeral. So each week we'll have different folks coming in and uh, talking about different aspects of how to, to sort of think ahead and uh, make plans uh, for that. We have a prayer service also on Wednesday for Ukraine. We will have our normal Wednesday noonday service at 12.05, and following that service, we will have, an, both of these will be in person and online, uh, a special prayer service for Ukraine. And last but not least, we still have some copies of the Lent devotionals out here on the table in the narthex. P please feel free to pick up any of those that you would like. Um, and I think that's it. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for coming.
please stand and join in singing the doxology. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O God. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was in every way tempted as we are, yet did not sin, by whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou hast of thy tender mercy given thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial of thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these gifts of thy creation. These gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. 
and we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. By whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength, so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence. Through Christ our Lord. stand for our recessional hymn. Let us bless the Lord. <laughs> 